All right, guys. Um, so, uh, hope you guys all did fine on your tests. Uh, yesterday, I'm sure it was probably really easy because you, all you had to do was type it. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think a couple of announcements. I just uh, had a meeting, um, a virtual meeting with the uh, admin. So, we're still kind of mulling over some stuff about how to uh, carry on for the next few uh, again, nothing's been decided right now. Uh, there's a meeting tomorrow, which I'm recording this on Monday, so there will be a meeting tomorrow on Tuesday regarding uh, spring break and some other things. But again, right now we're just going to kind of carry on as we planned. Um, so this is going to, again, it's, it's going to remain the same for me. I uh, hope you guys have already kind of caught, uh, caught the gist of how things are going to go. Um, if you guys have, again, any questions or concerns, uh, just shoot me a message on Canvas. I'll be checking that daily. Uh, should be available throughout the day, um, at least during regular school hours. Um, so for you guys to uh, to ask me questions and whatnot. So, yeah. Uh, so we just actually finished up the 20s. Hope you guys all have a warm and fuzzy about the 1920s and World War One and how those kind of connect. We're going to move into the Great Depression today. So uh, I have posted your slides um, under that Great Depression World War II uh, module on Canvas. So uh, again, if you check under there, um, need to uh, look at the Great Depression slides. Uh, is what it should be called um, or something along those lines. Uh, you'll find it and that way you can follow along while we do these lectures. Um, Again, nothing major. Uh, so I'm just going to walk you guys through some stuff today. Uh, and again, we'll probably uh, we'll have a discussion board. Not probably. We will have a discussion board today um, that talks about uh, essentially making the connections with the five causes of the Great Depression, which is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you guys an intro to that. We'll talk about the five causes, and that will be it for class today. So, um, if you have those Great Depression slides up, go ahead and open them. We're going to talk about um, slides 1 through 15. So, if you're looking at the whole thing, uh, we're going to go from literally the intro slide to where it says uh, Depression Politics. Um, so, we'll talk about the, politi uh, the politics of it later this week. Um, so... Uh, go ahead and open it. So your first slide, obviously, just kind of shows you guys some pictures of uh, the Great Depression and whatnot. It's just an intro. The time period we're going to be talking about will be about 1929 to 1939. And we'll talk about what gets us out of the Depression at the end of the unit. So uh, go to that first slide. So what is the Great Depression? We're going to talk um, just about this whole era of... Uh, or time in our country, it's it's a ten year period, and again, the depression is going to focus mainly on domestic uh, problems, domestic being in country problems. So, again, that uh, slide number two. What is the depression? The depression is just the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrial world. It lasts from twenty nine to thirty nine. Um, if you guys pay attention to the news today um, or the next couple of days. One of the things that a lot of people have been talking about are the uh, is the the uh, economy and kind of the the way it's um, going right now with this whole coronavirus scare. Let me read you guys a couple of updates. Um, so this morning, which is again this is Monday, uh, I woke up to well yesterday actually. The Federal Reserve took the emergency action to lower interest rates to almost zero. They're hoping to do that um, so that people will actually still spend money um, and put it back into the economy to keep the economy kind of rolling. So when the uh, when there is no interest rate or a very low interest rate, you can buy stuff, things like houses and stuff. You'll pay uh, you'll pay less for them with that low interest rate. All right. Um, then let's see, this morning there was a cyber attack that hit the U.S. and Human Services Department. Ah, here we go. 
So the Dow this morning, the like stock market, right? It opens up uh, 2,000 points down, um, and that actually triggered a, a temporary kind of emergency uh, pause. Um, and again, one of the things that you see is they're cutting the interest rates in order to uh, to stimulate the economy. But at the same time, people with everything that is going on, they're still panicking about this. Um, so, uh, again, paying attention to stuff like that from today. Actually, you might see a few parallels between um, now and really the Great Depression. I'm not saying by any means that we are about to have another Great Depression, but um, there are some similarities to be made with the stock market. So, if you go into slide number three, there are five causes for the Great Depression, right? Um, those are going to be diversification of the economy, distribution of wealth, banking, um, trade, and then kind of the crash from 1929 where we left off in the 1920s. So, um, go to slide number four. This is how fast we're going to click these off today. Um, all right, so cause number one is diversification of the economy. Um, so, there are three C's that you have to remember as far as what the diversification of the economy was and how that's a problem, okay? So in the 1920s, the three C's that the economy completely rested on are construction, consumer goods, and cars, right? Our entire economy was led by these three areas. Um, we talked in the 1920s about uh, consumer goods and life being easier uh, because of things like um, washing machines and refrigerators, all of those things that kind of are implemented in our daily lives that make it easier, right? In the 20s, everybody wants to uh, have these things to make their uh, their daily lives easier, and because of because of that that need, and remember the idea of. Uh, the assembly line and that demand, everybody wants some um, consumer goods to kind of make their lives easier, right? Construction's another thing. In the 20s, you see uh, the idea of the urban area uh, really grow. You look at the Gatsby movie, cities become a huge thing. Um, those urban areas being the ones that enjoy leisure and whatnot, everybody kind of goes and aims to at least work in those cities. Um, so construction being part of that because they're building those cities up, building up businesses, what have you. Uh, and then cars, again, we talked about the Model T and its evolution um, from like the first model being like 850 all the way down to I think it was $290 or something along those lines. Um, everybody wanted to buy a car. I think, again, one of the statistics I gave you in the 1920s, and you can go back and check this for yourself, because uh, I know I posted at least those 10 slides. Uh, I think 56% of Americans owned a car at one point in time, which is, you know, it sounds crazy today because most everyone owns a car. But um, back then, you know, 56%, that's a huge number for uh, ownership of something that new. Um, so those three areas of the economy are extremely powerful, but at the same time, they're extremely limited because they have nothing but that focus, right? Um, other areas of economic expansion don't really exist. So again, consumer goods, construction, and cars, those are your three leading ones. Uh, go to the next slide, slide number five. Um, distribution of wealth, that is number two. And if, if you pay attention, uh, like I said, there's five causes, and at the top of the slides, I will list out each uh, cause and kind of explain it. So your first one, again, being diversification of the economy. The second one, uh, slide number five, distribution of wealth, right? So, um, the U.S.'s need for participation in the economy is uh, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so, in the 1920s, the, the economy is kind of run by your middle and working class people, right? Those very rich people, they, uh, they don't participate as much, and we'll talk about um, that in the next few slides. Working class people and middle class people are the ones that are, one, they're keeping production running, and two, they uh, 
they're the ones that are actually spending the money. Um, one of the most important areas, and I've said it a hundred times, which is if you want to know how the United States economy is going, look at agriculture, right? Um, farmers' income, it actually drops, and it became so unstable that uh, that that aspect or that industry stops really contributing to the economy. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, so go to slide number six. As we talked in World War I, um, we are the providers for the war, at least for the, uh, the triple entente, right? So ourselves and Britain and France. So, uh, a year into the war, remember Britain and France, they go bankrupt. So we loan that, uh, money to them. Well, we also start supplying them with war materials and kind of that basic, uh, those basic necessities, um, one of those things being food. Uh, so during the First World War, we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding Britain, and we're feeding France, right? Um, when that happens, farmers, um, they actually expand their land. They buy more land so they can further produce food and they can make more money, right? During the war, that's possible. Um, there is such a high demand for food that, again, that idea of kind of producing more gives you more to sell, which means that you're making more money. So during the war, that's possible. After the war, we know that we rebuild Britain and France's infrastructure, and they um, they don't really need us anymore. So we kind of actually kill our own customers off because we help Britain and France get back on their feet and they, we, we build their infrastructure up, and so they're able to provide their own food, so they stop coming to us for that food. Well, because of that, those farmers, are, they still have that excess land, um, and they, um, They, they stay producing the same thing because in their mind, again, more production equals more product to sell, which means that they will make more money. And the problem is, is the demand for crops has fallen so much, um, but the production remains the same. It actually takes the price of food down so much that, you know, it's, they're not making any money off of it. So because of that, farmers are unable to sustain themselves. Um, so they take that excess land, right, and they sell off those crops, or not those crops, but that land, and they they can't pay their mortgages, they can't pay their bills, or the equipment that from the 1920s has come out to make life easier for farmers. They can't pay for any of that stuff, so they're forced to kind of like give up that lifestyle in some cases. Um, and at the very least, they're forced to give up a large amount of their land and ability to produce. So... Um, Go on to slide number seven. Basically, that results in um, a rural depression. Now, we're talking about in the 1920s, right? So, this is this is before the Great Depression ever kicks off. Um, farmers actually start seeing depression in their community, in their um, labor force, far before it hits the rest of the um the country. So again, that's why I say if you look at how agriculture is going, you'll know how the rest of the uh, country's economy is going. Um, and in the 1920s, farmers were struggling very bad, and it should have been a warning sign for um, the rest of the country of the impending like economic downturn that the, they were about to see. So um, farmers and rural type families are actually unable to share during that time of great economic boom. So, again, like I've said before, um, farmers actually, their lives don't change when the Great Depression hits because they're already used to it. They, they start seeing these things happen in the 1920s and they're struggling to survive in the 20s. So when the Great Depression comes, it's, it's nothing that they're not used to. So they're actually almost practicing ready for this. Sadly, um, that area is going to be uh, the one that is hit for the longest, not necessarily the worst, but definitely the longest. Um, so 
go to slide number eight. So you take that, and that is compared to um, your urban areas, right? Um, and the wealthy people. Wealthy people who could actually take more money and spend it and put it back into the economy, they instead, they choose to save it. Um, and they do exactly what everybody else does, which is they put their money in the bank, right? Um, and they don't dump it back into the economy. Now, it should have been a lot more obvious that this was happening across the, uh, the United States. However, we talked about that idea of consumer credit at the end of the 20s and the issue there is that it hides that problem. Um, the uh, during the the end of the twenties, right? Um, Sixty percent of the automobiles, right, uh, that have been sold, um, and eighty percent of the radios that are purchased, it's actually done on installment credit. So. Again, we talked about that idea of ownership, who actually owns what when you buy it with credit, um, and it's the bank. Uh, so 60% of the automobiles, 80% of the radios, and the problem is, is you also have stock that has been bought on credit, um, something that you cannot do, um, because it gives, it gives the impression that, again, a company's doing really well, or they have sold a lot of stock, but in reality, they haven't, um. No one actually owns it. Um, so that is your idea of divert or excuse me, distribution of wealth, right? So you see the the contrast between farmers or rural area people versus your urban people um, and how much they have uh, they have made or not made, how much they are contributing to the economy or not contributing to the economy. So uh, go on to slide number nine talk about banking all right there's two types of banks that are responsible for the great depression um small banks is going to be your first one there are thousands of small banks so back in the day um let's see uh let's just think of the people at your table right that you normally would sit with if we were not here online um Think about the people on your left and your right. Any of those people could have just opened a bank. You could have opened a bank. All it took was a person with a little bit of money and a really great bad idea. Um, they would just say, hey, I'm going to open First National Bank of Mr. Williams, and I'm going to make a bajillion dollars off of this. So um, small banks are never required. Neither are big banks at this time. They're not required to keep a reserve. Right, a reserve being um, kind of like an emergency stash of cash that will uh, keep you safe in a time of downturn, right? So, and what I mean by this, okay, so think about those of you who have checking and savings. Hopefully, that's all of you. Um, when you put your money in the bank, all right, normally if we were in class, I would ask you this question and let you ponder through it. I don't know how many of you guys understand how this works, but if you take your money to the bank, say you have a million dollars, right? And you say, okay, I want to open a checking account, put a million dollars in it. The minute you actually put that million dollars in the bank, it's gone. It's not actually there. Um, banks take that and they loan it out. Um, and this is how banks like kind of stay alive, right? They make money because they will give people your money. They will loan out your million dollars. Uh, either as a lump sum or in small like loans here and there, and they'll charge an interest rate on it. So if I went to a bank and said, "Hey, I need, I want to start a a business, right? I need a loan of a million dollars," they would loan me a million dollars with like a four percent interest rate on it, which would be like, I'm I'm really crappy at math. We all know this, right? I don't do math. So, um, but they they give me a four percent interest rate. Well, I pay them back the million dollars that they initially loaned me plus four percent of whatever a million is. Um, I think it's like 40000 Sure, that sounds good. 4000 I don't know, something, right? It's a couple thousand dollars. So they make that much money off of the fact that I got to borrow money from them. So with that, not only do they not keep a reserve so that if I went back and said, hey, you know what? I changed my mind. I need to withdraw this million dollars. That money's not there. So if they kept a reserve, 
uh, and it might it's based off however many people they have and customers and whatnot, that million dollars may or may not be there. So if I walk back and say, hey, I need my million dollars back, um, those small banks wouldn't have it because they don't keep a reserve, right? So the minute that you give them a million dollars, the million dollars is gone to a loan. Um, so if you went to go get your money, they would say, I'm sorry, like we don't have your money. Um, so additionally, those loans that are given out, um, people are vetted for those, right? So if I said, hey, I need to borrow a million dollars, they'd be like, oh, Mr. Williams, we're sorry. We see that you only make like chicken scratch and um, there's no way we're going to let you borrow that much. Now, you, I can borrow like maybe a hundred grand based off my income, based off my credit score, based off whatever it may be, right? Um, but small banks actually don't vet people. They don't look into your history as a, a buyer or a, um, somebody who, um, gets loans, all of those things, right? They don't check that. They just say, okay, uh, we know this guy, he's good people. Here's a million dollars. Like we're sure he'll pay us back. So small banks are not, they're not keeping a reserve so that your money is still there and they're not, they're not checking who they are loaning money to. So surprise, not only small banks, but big banks are also really, really bad at using their money. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that Dawes plan we talked about in the 1920s. You guys remember the circle? It's where the U.S. agreed to uh, loan money to Germany. Well, it wasn't just the government, right? The government just give their money away. They actually had to have it loaned to them from bigger banks. So bigger banks lend the government money. The government is loaning it to Germany. Um, and then, again, you guys know the cycle from uh, the other day's lesson. So we know what the Dawes plan is. If you have any confusion about that, let me know. Um, I can maybe send you a picture of how that circle works. I would draw it for you right now, but I do not have a blackboard. So um, banking is a cause of the Great Depression. Small banks and big banks. Small banks being the fact they don't keep a reserve. Um, they're not lending money wisely. And big banks is because they are contributing to the DOS plan. It hurts that uh, financial thing. So uh, go to the next slide, slide number 10. That's trade. So... Um, yeah, uh, again, we, and we talked about this a little bit with the agriculture deal, but, um, we are the number one, like suppliers for Britain and France and actually the rest of Europe, um, after the first world war, because we don't have our stuff destroyed. We don't fight world war one on our own soil. So our factories are farms, our production is not hurt. Um, Britain and France, on the other hand, they are. They're they're hurt and they're kind of, you know, they are leaning on us. So after the war, we sell very heavily to Europe. Europe takes that and they actually rebuild their own economy, um, their infrastructure, and they get back on their feet. Well, it does away with our trading partner and we lose that business, which hurts our economy. Um, so again, you have trade, you have banking, distribution of wealth, and the diversification of the economy. Your last one, if you will go to the next slide, so is the crash, and I put kind of there. To be clear, the, the crash isn't actually what causes the, the Great Depression, right? And this is why I tell you again, don't freak out about what's going on with our economy now. Just because our, our market is down, stocks are down, is not going to cause us to go into this Oh, like another Great Depression. That's not the case. What is going to, like, you know, happen is business might be down for a while. We might hit a recession. But our economy is not going to crash. Um, as you're looking, there are so many things, like, the, the causes for the Great Depression are, um, they're kind of interwoven. So there are a bunch of variables, right? And you can't just fix one, right? Uh, you can fix a crash. Um, you can fix banking. You can fix trade. But when these all happen kind of at the same time and they go on for so long they're so difficult to fix because you have to rise them all up at the same time instead of just fixing one or two fixing one or two is not going to help and we'll see that as we talk about uh like president hoover and his response um versus kind of like president roosevelt and see what he does with it um which again a lot of people credit roosevelt with the 
end of the Great Depression, and really, in reality, the only thing that gets us out of depression is uh, war. We'll talk about World War II and how that is going to affect and cause the end of the Great Depression. So, um, go to slide 12, which is bull market and the collapse. Okay, so let's talk about the crash. Um, we've talked about stocks a little bit. I'm going to go in a little bit more depth here. So, basically in the 20s, right, um, this thing called speculation. People expected that you would buy stocks at a low price, right? So if you guys are stock buyers, right now is a really good time to invest because stocks are down because of the market, right? So if you watch the news, um, talk about the Dow being down 2,000 points, a lot of very big companies have got stocks for a low price right now. So if you were to buy some and you sit on them and wait, that price will actually rise. So you'll be able to get money out of those stocks. Now, um, the idea at the time was speculative. There's no guarantee that stocks are going to rise or fall in a particular company. Now, if you play the stock market now, you kind of have a good idea of what industry is doing what. But at the same time, it's still not necessarily safe. It's just a more educated guess. Or at this point in time, it's, it's hopeful. So in the 20s, people are buying stocks and expecting to sit on them for a long time, right? Um, which, again, if you are going to play the stock market, the best way you go in is with a long-term expectation. Um, don't go in and think you're going to cash out in a week and make a million dollars. You go in and you sit on them for a while and you watch and you see things grow. You're going to see things affect it. Um, and sometimes it is very safe to pull your money out. And then other times it is uh, it's pretty dangerous. So in the 1920s, people saw it as safe. It's something they couldn't lose at. Um, and so they started investing tons of money into the stock market. Well, we didn't understand at this point in time that actually stocks should have a limit on it based on how much the company itself is worth. So if Apple is worth a trillion dollars, let's say Apple, if the company is worth a trillion dollars, you can only buy a trillion dollars worth of stocks. Um, in the 20s, people were buying so much stock that the stocks themselves became worth more than the company itself was. So, um, and this is problematic because, again, stocks are partial ownership in a company. So say if you bought $3 trillion worth of stocks in Apple, if Apple was to sell the business, right, they would have to pay off their stock people. Um, there's $3 trillion worth of stock bought, but the company's only worth a trillion dollars. Somebody's not getting paid. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, eventually people start actually selling their stocks off, right? Um, and this is kind of, again, that idea that stocks being worth more than the company, people start selling their stocks off. Well, when, if I have so much invested in Apple, when I sell all my stocks for Apple, it's actually going to make the price of stocks go down. So let's say you bought, you know, 10 shares for a dollar a piece, right? So you've got $10 invested. Well, let's say the price of stocks went from a dollar to $10. So now you've made $100, right? Well, so many people start selling their stocks off. Well, instead of $10, it goes down to $8. So now you've only made $80. Um, and it keeps going down and people see it going down and they're thinking, okay, well, I want to at least get my $10 back out of it. So they try to pull their money out before they actually lose money because stocks dip below a dollar that they initially invested it in, right? If you have stocks and they dip below the the price that you invested in, your smartest option is actually to wait. You'll wait until they at least get back up to a dollar or they're back up to $5 because the stock market will go up and down based off who is selling and buying at the time. Um, so instead of panicking and pulling your money out, if you just sit and wait, it'll eventually bounce back. Whatever stocks you have will bounce back to that price. Um, but in the 20s, people didn't understand this, so they just start pulling their money out really, really quick. Um, and when they start selling their stocks, it makes those those the cost and the price of stocks go down, so people are not actually making money. So, um, yeah, last point, businesses and banks invest rather than the common person. Um yeah, so again, we talk about banking, and they're using their their money irresponsibly. So they actually take your million dollars that you've deposited, right, and they loan it out to 
people to invest in the stock market. And again, when people buy stocks on margin, the bank is the one who's actually owning them. So when the stock market starts going down, the bank's actually losing money. Uh, go on to slide 13. So additionally, 1920s, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates to stimulate the economy. That just happened um, yesterday, right? The Fed actually just cut interest rates down to almost zero dollars, right? Um, so that means that they would loan you money without expecting a payoff. Um, yeah, think about refinancing my car because my interest rate on my car is like 4.9%. Um, if I refinance it right now and had a low interest rate, oof, guys, I would pay pretty much ticket price on my car, maybe $100 or something. So I'm not actually paying that much for the car, just what the sticker value is instead of the sticker value plus almost 5% of the car's worth. So they cut interest rates down to zero. Um and they are trying to stimulate economic growth, right? Because again, when you cut interest rates, people are more likely to buy things because they don't have to pay excess money. Um, uh, let's see. Fed limits uh, money supply to discourage lending. Um, so now they're taking money out of the economy, right? Um, this makes your money actually worth more than, you know. So for example, my dad will always tell me stories about when he was young, he could go on a full date, gas and everything for like a $20 bill. Like you can't even get into the movies for $20 now, let, let alone like do dinner and a movie and gas and ice cream or whatever else your date includes. Um, but that was because back in the day, $20 was worth more than $20 is now. It would get you a lot further, right? Um, so this causes banks to... Uh, to run out of money because the Fed is actually taking money out of the money supply that is circulating. Um, so now, again, that money that they have loaned out, there's even less of it to go around to give people. Um, when banks, when this stock starts failing, people start pulling their money out of the banks as well. Um, and again, with those small banks especially not keeping a reserve, there isn't money there um, for them to get out. So a lot of the banks end up just shutting their doors and saying, hey, we're closed, sorry. That's because there's no money to give out to people and people are mad about it. Um, obviously, if I had you know, a trillion dollars in the bank and then somebody was telling me that I couldn't have my trillion dollars, that is mine, um, yeah, we're gonna have problems. So again, you look at this all being interwoven, they're all kind of interdependent on each other, um, all these five causes. So uh, stocks are falling, banks are closed, um, this is going to cause workers um, to start closing as well because you're going to go down from your luxury to your necessity. So we talked about the assembly line, right? So let's talk about the fact. So there's maybe um, 10 people on an assembly line and you're making a car. One person puts on the right set of tires. The other person put on the left set of tires. Um, then you're having another person screw on the lug nuts to make sure the tires don't fall off. And then another person's painting one door and another person's painting the other door. Um, one person screwed on the mirror. Um, you're going to start, if you're that employer, looking at that assembly line and saying, okay, maybe we can get rid of one of these guys who is putting on tires and he can put on all the tires instead of just two of them. Uh, we can get on the, rid of the lug nut guy and actually the, the guy that puts on tires, he could also probably screw those things on. So we'll save some costs there and so on and so forth. And they're going to, they're going to fire all of these people off because they're trying to save the money that they're spending so that their business doesn't go under. Um, that is going to force people out into a, like, you know, a, a position of unemployment. They're not going to make money, um, which means that they are not going to spend money which means that the economy is not going to start working, which means that there's going to be no money to loan out and so on and so forth. And it's just kind of this cycle, right? There's no money to earn because the places are closing. That gives people no money to spend. Um, without money spent, there is nothing to stimulate the economy. The economy can't grow again because people are scared. Um, I'll tell you, and it, and it this has some long-lasting effects. My grandparents, who lived through the uh, the Great Depression, when my grandfather died, I was a uh, was a kid, and we were cleaning out the house, and like you could flip through pages of the books in his library, and there'd be like a hundred dollar bills fall out, just because for the rest of his life after the Depression, the man never trusted a bank again. 
because again, his money was gone. Um, same thing. He had actually buried a bunch of mayonnaise jars in the yard full of cash. And I'm like, I'm confident because they sold the property. Uh, we never found all the money that was in that house. And that is simply because he refused for the rest of his life, more or less, to put his money into a bank um, because they had caused him so many problems. So it's it's a, it's a kind of a crazy cycle. And again, that snowball effect kind of goes around. People are losing jobs. People are not spending money because of this. The people that do have jobs are saving money. Um, and it's going to just kind of go all the way down the line. So go to number 14, Black Thursday. Uh, it's the 24th of October, uh, 1929. So mass shares or stocks are sold because people are panicking because of the speculation deal of buying low and selling high. They don't want to lose their money. Um, your bigger investors start um, selling their stocks as well because, again, your bigger investors, they own more parts of the company. So if you own 10% of Apple stocks, you'd be considered a big investor, right? You have that much of their company bought. Um so big businesses actually see the economy start slowing, but they actually continue to buy stocks to try to get in while the getting is good, right? Because they're they're seeing these things go down in price, so they're spending a lot of money. Once the market starts dropping, um, people pull their stocks out really, really quick. Um, and then once some people start, a lot of other people start pulling out as well. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Within a week, there's $30 billion wiped off the market um, just from people having panicked, right? See, again, you see a lot of this stuff with the, the coronavirus. People are panicking right now. Um, and they're pulling their their money. They're stocking up on toilet paper. I don't know what that is supposed to do, but there is no toilet paper to be had. Um, same thing with, like, food and stuff. Like, this is <laughs> – they're treating it like it's the end of the world, right? Um but again, not, and I'm not saying that there's another Great Depression coming, but you can see the similarities, right? Panic. Panic will do a lot of things to the market. And in the Great Depression, that same thing happens. So, yeah, uh, two years after Black Thursday and kind of that economic downturn, the market is at only 11% of where it was at in the 20s. So, uh, go to slide 15, your last slide. Uh, loss of consumer confidence. Um, Basically, the priority of spending changes because futures dim, and like we just talked about, it is going to go from luxury to necessity. People are only going to either hire as a company or spend as like a family or an individual on what is necessary, right? And that's going to shake business business confidence. It's going to force labor uh, to be laid off, and it's going to be this mass kind of epidemic of kind of what's what's going on. So that's your intro to the Great Depression, right? Uh, and we'll check back either tomorrow or the next day. We'll talk about uh, politics and kind of what's going to happen there. So um, yeah, uh, you need to roll over to the discussion board and um, there will be a discussion question posted uh, about um, the Great Depression versus the 1920s, and we'll talk about kind of the connections there. Just make sure you guys are understanding kind of what's going on. Um, yeah, check Canvas every day for announcements. If you have any questions, um, if I I might I might do another uh, question board so that I can kind of see that everybody's like uh, questions are posted. So if if that's the case, you may want to check. There might be two discussion boards posted, one for your questions so that we can see them all as a class. Um, and another one for uh, the uh, kind of the post today. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, the next couple of days, you guys will have a primary source come up. Um, maybe a video or two. We'll see what uh, what I decide to do with it. So uh, anyway, all right. Um, that's it for the day. Uh, so just, again, check that discussion board. Make sure you're participating. Make sure you're checking Canvas every day. Remember, it's a grade. It's how we're doing your Brain Wrangler grades. Um, yeah, if you guys have any other questions or issues um, that don't pertain to class or anything, feel free to inbox me, ask me those questions, um, and I will make sure that we're kind of all on the same page while we're still working through this. Um, so, all right, guys, take care. Uh, have a good one.